pleasure uh, to join you this afternoon. And, uh, you know, looking at it interestingly from my role as I uh, increasingly take over the, the AUA educational mission, um, I think these sort of collaboratives like this are really fantastic and, and makes you realize that um, good education doesn't necessarily have to be done in person, but you could actually do a lot of didactic stuff uh, just using our virtual platforms. So um, I want to really thank you in advance for your time and your attention. Um, I've structured this talk to be about 40 to 45 minutes, so there's certainly some opportunity for questions that might come up. And what I want to talk to you about are the new uh, microhematuria guidelines that uh, we actually just completed work in in March of this year. And they were actually scheduled to be released at the AUA meeting just a few weeks ago uh, and have been pushed back for about three to four weeks. So you're getting a little bit of a sneak peek on what we're going to be seeing with the new guidelines and, and perhaps some of the rationale behind them. Um, I'm going to start by uh, just going through some of my disclosures, and, and they're on two slides. The first slide here really highlights that I've done a fair amount of work in different clinical trials uh, looking at biomarkers, biomarkers for hematuria, uh, looking for urothelial cancer, biomarkers for patients who have a documented history of either upper or lower tract urinary carcinomas. And, and I would suffice it to say that at present, as I'm going to talk about, none of these biomarkers are quite at the point where they're prime time. And you're going to see from my discussion that they're not currently listed in the uh, guidelines as what should be part of our standard of care in our index patients. Uh, my other relevant disclosures are uh, more related to this talk, which is that indeed I am and was a member of the, the 2020 microhematuria guidelines panel. And uh, I've also co authored. Uh, ironically, with my, my former co-residents, uh, Steve Borgian and Dan Barokas, both uh, the Campbell's urology uh, chapter on the evaluation and management of hematuria, um, as well as teaching the course uh, on hematuria. And, and it's notable that both of the chapter and the course span the full spectrum of hematuria, from microscopic disease all the way to, to gross macroscopic hematuria. So... What I want to do is touch on three key points here. One is to go through a little bit of the details of, you know, why do we evaluate this? What's the rationale? Um, why do we even come up with guidelines for evaluating hematuria? And what's the scope of the problem? Uh, the second is to look at shortcomings of prior guidelines. And, and admittedly, I'm going to focus on the 2012 AUA guidelines and really use that as a springboard to explain what we are doing differently and what we did do differently so that you can hopefully understand why the change I believe will be beneficial not only for us as practitioners, but also for our patients who go through these studies. And then I'll walk you through a synopsis of the 2020 microhematuria guidelines. And I'm going to be the first to say that I, I have not put a laundry list of all 26 guidelines, but I've really broken it down into what I think are the key salient guidelines, and then perhaps some literature or some data that would support why we are, um, why we made a certain statement, or why did we change something, or why do we not change something, for example. So let's start with the first of these. What's the rationale for evaluating hematuria? So when you um, look at hematuria, it's indeed one of the most common diagnoses that we see. So almost 25% or more of urologic evaluations are due to some type of hematuria, whether it be micro or macroscopic. And if you look at the prevalence of hematuria, admittedly, it depends a little bit upon your screening population. So um, if you look at this amalgam of a variety of different series, uh, it shows that the prevalence of hematuria is 6.5%. And indeed, uh, that range is from 2% to almost a third of patients, which is dependent once again on the population that you're looking at. Now, we all know this, that the differential diagnosis is indeed quite extensive. It really is any component of the urinary tract um, that is in contact with urethelium. So it can be the kidney, the ureter, all portions of the ureter, the bladder, prostate in men, and certainly urethra in men and women. And I always think about the big four diagnoses, malignancy or cancer, stone disease, 
infection or inflammation, and in men, prostatic diseases. But as you can see listed on the left, it's important to recognize that there are a variety of other conditions that can certainly contribute to a diagnosis of hematuria. So one of the key take home messages I'm gonna tell you is when we constructed these guidelines, we were really looking at the risk of malignancy. And, and so therefore we were looking at hematuria as a potential screening symptom or um, sign of malignancy. Admittedly, we know that hematuria can come from stone disease, it can come from inflammation, it can come from trauma, but our thought was that these conditions would largely be associated with some sort of pain, discomfort, or symptoms, which would prompt a directed evaluation. So just remember, when I talk about microhematuria in the guidelines, all of this is towards an eye of what is the risk of malignancy and tailoring tests to look for malignancy. So what is the risk? So this is a really nice study published in European Urology about two years ago. This is from the DETECT-1 collaboration. It's a 40 hospital um, uh, multi-center study uh, in which all patients referred for hematuria over a two-year time period had cystoscopy and some type of upper tract imaging. And what did they find? Um, firstly, the likelihood of urinary tract cancer was 10%. Not surprisingly, it was higher for gross macroscopic hematuria, 138.8%, versus microhematuria, which was 3%. And if you said, well, what kind of cancer are you talking about? The majority of it was bladder, 8%, but there were a rare number of patients who had renal cortical tumors, so kidney cancer, upper tract urethelial carcinoma, as well as prostate cancer. So what are the current shortcomings? What's the, what's the scope of the problem that we have here? Why do we even have hematuria guidelines? The issue in hand is if you look at large health systems, and we've looked at this in our own data, under 50% of patients with hematuria are actually referred for urologic evaluation, and that is particularly exacerbated in women where only about a quarter of women are referred for evaluation. Um, Yer Lotan and the group down in Dallas uh, looked even more pointedly at those patients who had risk factors for cancer and found that in those with cancer, only about a quarter received imaging and just over 10% underwent cystoscopy. So we clearly have a gap in the care. Who's at highest risk? Um, women. So this is a nice study out of the University of Chicago group that looked at patients who were eventually diagnosed with bladder cancer and then looked back in time and said, okay, when did they first present in, with hematuria and how many days elapsed from their hematuria self-reported diagnosis until the time they had a bladder cancer diagnosis? And not surprisingly, what they found was that interval from hematuria to diagnosis was longer in women than men. And why is that? As we probably all know, in many cases, Blood in the urine in women is attributed to urinary tract infections, gynecologic sources, and even beyond a diagnosis, these patients were less likely to receive any type of evaluation or imaging. Who's the other at-risk population? Um, the Vanderbilt group showed in a large uh, series uh, looking at their health system that African-American patients, both men and women, are less likely to undergo any aspect of a hematuria evaluation, whether that's urology referral, cystoscopic evaluation, or any type of imaging for the condition. So hopefully I've been able to highlight for you that we have a gap in who we're evaluating. And we are missing a lot of patients at a health system level who have hematuria, some of whom will have pathology, who are not getting evaluated. And, and therefore there needs to be some type of evidence-based evaluation to better capture these patients. So let me talk to you a little bit about some of the shortcomings of the prior guidelines. And as I said, I'm gonna focus on the AUA guidelines, but it's important to take a step back and, and sort of look at the scope of what we battle as residents in training, even those of us that are in practice. So I don't want you to be bogged down in, in this relatively busy table but I wanna underscore it to show you the following. If you look at guidelines, you've got the 2012 AUA guidelines, 
the Canadian Consensus Statement, American College of Physicians, NICE, the British System, the Japanese Urologic Association, the Dutch Association, the Scottish Guidelines, the Swedish Guidelines. So the take home that you should have from what I'm showing you here is the following. There's a remarkable amount of variability when you look at microscopic hematuria guidelines and consensus statements. There's variability with respect to what is being defined as microscopic hematuria, who should be evaluated, what type of evaluation they should have, when this evaluation should occur, and who is the audience? Are we looking at urologists, urology practitioners, PAs and nurse practitioners included, or is this geared more towards primary care physicians? So if we look at the 2012 guidelines, these guidelines were tailored to essentially maximize the likelihood of finding cancer, or saying that another way, the goal was to minimize the risk of missing a cancer diagnosis. As a result of that, the evaluation was fairly rigorous. It said that CT urography and cystoscopy should be used in all patients over 35 years of age with microscopic hematuria and was agnostic or blind to an individual person's risk. So if you think about what the structure of that was, then I would tell you that the mission was probably accomplished. So this is a nice paper that came from Matt Nielsen and his collaborators in JAMA Internal Medicine. And it basically looked at a theoretical simulated primary care mo primary cancer model. And you can see over here on the far left-hand side, the total of number of urinary tract cancers that the model predicted. And you can see when you look at the AUA guidelines from 2012 on the far right in the red box, that the AUA guidelines would pick up in this theoretical model the most number of cancers and miss the least number of cancers when you compare it to say the four other guidelines that I've shown here, the Dutch, Canadian, Kaiser, and HRI. But at what cost? And the cost is, first of all, financial. So remember that unlike any of the other guidelines, the AUA guidelines required CT in every patient. So not surprisingly, the cost of CT urography was incrementally higher, and therefore the cost of the AUA evaluation to identify cancer was incrementally higher than any of the risk stratified models, such as the HRI and the Kaiser Permanente, and certainly the Dutch and the Canadian, which use either renal ultrasonography or no upper tract imaging. The other cost is really a risk of radiation-induced cancers. So remember that all of these radiation-induced cancer risks are, are theoretical, and they're calculated based upon the ionizing radiation, the exposure that a patient would have, and then looking at what we have in the ambient environment and predicting the risk of cancer. But nonetheless, if you take those assumptions in hand, the AUA guidelines and shown in red had by far the highest predicted likelihood of radiation-induced cancers when compared to the other guideline statements. And all of this, as mentioned, was attributable to the ubiquitous use of CT imaging. And so when we looked at the 2020 guidelines, this was really going to be a paradigm shift. And the paradigm shift was recognizing that, number one, um, we want to try to provide a more individualized approach for hematuria evaluation. And we want to try to tailor the intensity of the evaluation to the risk an individual patient may have. And, and one of the things that we reconciled and that we accepted was that this approach will not necessarily identify every urinary tract cancer. Admittedly, we already tried that with the last guidelines, and they were heavily criticized over time for being too aggressive with too much associated risk. Our hopes were by doing more of a risk stratified approach that was more modulated, that the evaluations would be more standardized, there would be less variation where patients or providers didn't want to get a certain type of test because they felt like it was over aggressive or too aggressive. And, and it would cause patients 
to be more willing and providers to be more willing in a primary care setting to evaluate this condition. So missing the risk of a delayed diagnosis. And finally, the goal here, and we've all seen them, is trying to avoid unnecessary evaluations in low risk patients. And I think we all know who they are, and I'm gonna talk about that group, but they're always the patients where we all look at their clinical demographics and their risk factors, and we say to ourselves, geez, it's really unlikely this person has urothelial cancer, yet we have to do the evaluations nonetheless. So let me summarize for you the key take home messages from the 2020 microhematuria guidelines. I'm gonna just break these up broadly into different categories. The first is diagnosis and definition. So similar to prior guidelines, um, Microhematuria is once again defined as greater than or equal to three red blood cells per high power field on a single microscopic evaluation in a properly collected specimen. Why a single collection? Frankly, it's a single collection because there is no good data to suggest multiple collections actually changes your diagnostic accuracy. And furthermore, we know that hematuria is intermittent. So we didn't want to overlook the presence of microhematuria to mandate that multiple collections were needed. Why three red blood cells per high power field? Probably the best data is this paper from Rich Matulowicz, published in Bladder Cancer. What they did was they looked at a cohort of 46,000 patients, and they looked at both urinalysis and dipstick, and I'm gonna come back to the dipstick in a moment, and they looked at different urinalysis thresholds, and then looked at the diagnostic accuracy for cancer. And what they found was in this large cohort, the highest sensitivity and the lowest negative likelihood ratio was at three to 10 red blood cells per high power field. So it's important to recognize that urinalysis is a screening tool, a screening tool for essentially bladder cancer or urinary tract cancer. And therefore you wanna have a test that has a relatively high sensitivity so you are not potentially missing candidates that need to be further evaluated. What about dipstick? And, and if your medical center is anything like mine, we receive a lot of referrals from our primary care colleagues for the evaluation of hematuria in patients who only have a positive dipstick. And there are two take homes. Number one, I think as we all know, we should not be evaluating microscopic hematuria purely based upon dipstick alone, but it is important to recognize that a positive dipstick should prompt a formal microscopic evaluation of urine. So let's talk about these two points. Why shouldn't we just evaluate somebody based upon a dipstick? Because dipstick doesn't detect red blood cells. It actually detects the peroxidase activity of hemoglobin. And so there's the risk of false positives. False positives from myoglobinuria, dehydration, exercise, menstrual blood in women, and povidone iodine in those that have had any sort of perineal preparation. But if I take you back to this Matulowicz paper, what he showed very nicely was that the extent of blood on a dipstick is indeed associated with a higher likelihood of a positive urinalysis, as well as a higher likelihood of malignancy. So for example, if you look at a patient who has a large amount of blood on dipstick, they certainly had a higher likelihood of having a positive urinalysis and cancer down the line. So certainly in my practice, if we have somebody that comes in with moderate or large blood on dipstick, um, obviously we're always rechecking the urinalysis, but even if that urinalysis is negative, truthfully, although it's not written in the guidelines, we bring those persons back for another urinalysis, just given the intermittent nature of hematuria. Let's go to initial evaluation. So a really important point, we looked at our health system recently and we found that there were so many patients who had evidence of hematuria that was purely chalked up to being on anticoagulation because so many patients are on anticoagulation now. And, and the key take home point is we really should be taking that out of the equation. The same evaluation should be performed irrespective if they're on antiplatelet therapy or, or any type of anticoagulation impacting the coagulation cascade. There's numerous studies that have published on this. I'm showing you one by Ku and colleagues, 400 plus patients with microscopic hematuria, 5.8% with genitourinary tract malignancy, 15% of this cohort was on anticoagulation, and there was no difference on the diagnostic yield for cancer based on anticoagulation status. Now, 
let's take a patient and assume that they have hematuria and it's been attributed to a urinary tract infection. When should we or should we get a repeat urinalysis? The answer is yes, you should get a repeat urinalysis following the treatment to ensure resolution. When to get it? A little bit more questionable. So it was broadly written partly because there's really not very good data on it as three weeks to three months after the initial urinalysis. Personally speaking, I have a lot of reservations about repeating a urinalysis at three weeks. I think if the patient had an infection that was significant enough for them to have hematuria at three weeks, they probably still have enough inflammation that they're going to have some microscopic blood. So I would very much recommend airing closer to that three month time point as opposed to the three week time point. Why repeat it? Well, we, we've seen this in numerous studies. Women, um, unfortunately, with irritative voiding symptoms are more often attributed to infection. They're more likely to receive multiple courses of antibiotics and receive symptomatic treatment without evaluation. And this can occur in up to 50% of women. And we all know that a woman or even a man with irritative voiding symptoms and microscopic hematuria may well have carcinoma in situ or some other type of pathology in the bladder beyond an infection. So it's critical to make sure we have a culture positive documented uh, infection. And if we don't, then they truly do need a more substantial evaluation. What about urine markers? I, I talked to you about the fact that I've done a number of different clinical trials looking at the role of urinary biomarkers. And I would say the simple take home message at this point is that neither urine cytology or urine based biomarkers should be used in the initial evaluation of a patient with microscopic hematuria. A pretty nice study done out of UCSF looked at almost 3,000 patients with microscopic hematuria, all of whom had a urine cytology done. And only two of all of these patients who had a negative hematuria evaluation for microscopic hematuria and a positive cytology actually eventually were diagnosed with urethelial cancer. And the study itself had a 10% false positive rate. Okay, so at this time, urine cytology or urine bi based biomarker should not be used in the initial evaluation of a patient with microhematuria. When can we use some of these tools? Um, Likely in the patient who has persistent microscopic hematuria, who you're, you're worried about their symptom complex. They've got irritative voiding symptoms. They have microhematuria. Perhaps they have other risk factors for carcinoma in situ. And in those situations, urine cytology or even biomarkers may have a potential role in that setting. So one of the key differences for the 2020 microhematuria guidelines is this concept of risk stratification. And the idea of risk stratification is that we should now be looking at patients who are coming in and categorizing them as low, intermediate, and high risk for urinary tract malignancy. What are these risk criteria based on? Gender, age, smoking use, how much microhematuria do they have, namely number of red blood cells per high power field, the persistence of microhematuria, whether it is something that is once and done or persistently in the urine, and do they have an antecedent? Do they have a history of gross macroscopic hematuria? So this is the risk classification, and I'm going to walk you through each of these different boxes. So let's start first with the low-risk cohort, okay? So the low-risk cohort are those patients that are younger, women under the age of 50, men under the age of 40, those that are never smokers or under 10 pack year smokers, those with three to 10 red blood cells per high power field, and no risk factors for urethelial cancer. And when we mean risk factor for urethelial cancer, I've listed at the bottom. So what we're talking about is patients who have irritative symptoms, prior pelvic radiotherapy, exposure to certain chemotherapeutic agents such as cyclophosphamide, occupational exposure, whether they have foreign bodies such as suprapubic tubes or urethral catheters, or a family history of urethelial cancer. So the low-risk patient has to meet all of these criteria. One of the other questions that's come up when I've given this talk is, well, what about, you only talk about smoker, but what about people that use chew? What about marijuana? What about um, cigars? And the, the truth of the matter is the data on all of those is relatively poor. So we've written this based on the best data we have, which is tobacco exposure from smoking, 
Um, but certainly, I think when you have patients who have other types of tobacco exposure, um, you have to extrapolate a little bit from these data. Okay, so this is a low risk patient. Let's transition over to an intermediate risk patient. So these patients are a little older, women age 50 to 59, men age 40 to 59. Um, they have a little bit more of a smoking exposure history, 10 to 30 pack years, perhaps more red blood cells per high power field, 11 to 25. Um, it's a low risk patient who's never been evaluated. Okay, and we're gonna get to that in a minute, but let's say we have a low risk patient who's in that far left hand group, and as you're going to see, one of the options in those patients is just surveillance and repeat testing. You cannot be a low risk patient forever if you have red blood cells in the urine. So at some point, a low risk patient defaults to a higher risk patient if they have persistent microscopic hematuria. And the final intermediate risk classification is if they have any risk factors as shown below. Okay, so if a patient meets any one of these criteria, they're now intermediate risk. And the high risk is a patient who meets any one of these following patients over 60. Those that have substantial tobacco exposure, such as greater than 30 pack year smoking history, more than 25 red blood cells per high power field on a single year analysis, or somebody that comes into your office and tells you they have a history of gross macroscopic hematuria. So what's the rationale for defining risk? Um, well, we could know from other publications in the past that the likelihood of cancer really varies across risk groups. And so the goal is modulate your evaluation and the intensity of your evaluation to match up the risk of cancer. So let's take, for example, the hematuria risk index, which is one of these risk stratified models. It came out of the Kaiser system, 4,000 patients. If you had a low risk patient, the likelihood of cancer in their group was 0.2%, moderate was 1.6%, and high was 11%. And so obviously you wanna tailor that high risk group, uh, which has a one in 10 chance of cancer to be the most rigorous type of evaluation. So key point for low risk evaluation. So we're going to that low risk group, okay? New concept is shared decision-making. And you have two options. You can decide with the patient just simply to come and bring the patient back and repeat a urinalysis in six months. Or if your clinical suspicion is somehow higher, the patient is worried, the patient wants evaluation, you can proceed with a cystoscopy and a renal ultrasound. Now, one of the key take home messages, let's say a patient or you says, you know something, I'm gonna come back in six months. That sounds pretty good. I'd rather not have all this imaging testing and cystoscopy. Let's say they come back in six months, they get a repeat urinalysis. This person still has now three to 10 red blood cells or more than 10 red blood cells per high power field. They are now reclassified as not low risk, but now intermediate or high risk. And they need some type of evaluation with cystoscopy and some type of upper tract imaging. So the key take home message is we did not want a low risk patient to be spinning in a repeat urinalysis loop for perpetuity, three, six, 12, 18 months. At some point after six months, if they have not had an evaluation, but they still have blood in their urine, they need to be evaluated through a slightly more rigorous diagnostic. What's the rationale for low risk? Uh, well, look, the, the overall risk of malignancy is low. We all know, and as I've talked about it, imaging has a risk from the study, the radiation exposure, as well as um, some data has been published on the amount of additional things that we find on CTs, and then the, the, the resultant need for um, more ancillary procedures and testing that the patient goes through, which in, it, in and of itself contributes to cost. And we know that although cystoscopy is overall uh, a low risk procedure, there is a small associated risk, namely pain and perhaps infection. Let's go to the intermediate risk group, okay? Intermediate risk patient, patient should undergo a cystoscopy now and a renal ultrasound, okay? Why renal ultrasound? Let's take a step back and first look at some of the, the distinguishing features between renal ultrasound and CT scan. So renal ultrasonography is less expensive. There's no ionizing radiation. We don't have to give the patient intravenous contrast. It's actually quite good at identifying renal cortical lesions. But the downsides of renal ultrasound are, notably, it's operator dependent, and it has a relatively low sensitivity for upper tract urothelial carcinoma. So let's, let's sort of extrapolate on this a little more. So I mentioned that for upper tract carcinomas, the sensitivity CTU is about 94%, ultrasound's about 
So CTU is clearly better at detecting upper tract malignancy, but we have to keep in mind, particularly for intermediate risk patients, that really the overall rate of upper tract carcinomas are low. This is a very nice study from Commander and colleagues published about two or three years ago. They looked at how often in a large hematuria series did they find upper tract urothelial carcinoma, and in their gross hematuria population, it was 0.6%. In their microhematuria population, it was zero out of close to 500 patients had upper tract carcinomas, and there were three bladder cancers. So the idea here really is your pretest probability is low enough that you're probably not going to miss an upper tract carcinoma in the intermediate risk group. And furthermore, if you look overall at cost again, and this is a nice um, paper from Halpern and colleagues published a few years ago, and you compare renal ultrasound with cystoscopy versus CT with cystoscopy across an entire spectrum of microhematuria. So this is not a risk-adopted approach. CT allowed you to find one additional cancer, but at a cumulative cost across a population uh, uh, of interest of almost $6 million in their cohort. So clearly, you're finding a small incremental gain in cancer at an astronomically high cost. Now, let's go to the high-risk group. So this is the high-risk group is, is really the group where they should have very much the same evaluation as what we're doing now, which is cystoscopy with some sort of axial upper tract imaging. And at present, multiphasic CT urography still remains the study of choice for high-risk microscopic hematuria. And again, I'd highlight for you what you probably know already, which is it must be a triphasic study with a non-contrast, a nephrogenic, and an excretory phase. Why all three phases? You can see very clearly here that on the non-contrast and the nephrogenic phase, perhaps you get some suggestion of a filling defect in the renal pelvis. Perhaps again, some hydronephrosis can be appreciated, but it's not until you have the delayed phase where you can clearly see a soft tissue filling defect in the urothelium. What's the accuracy of CT urography? It's excellent. So the sensitivity is over 90% and the specificity over 95% for diagnosing upper tract and lower tract urothelial carcinomas. And one of the algorithms that are increasingly used, and this is the algorithm that we've been using for some time, is this concept of split dose CT urography. So on the left-hand side, this is the standard single dose. So a patient comes in, they get a non-contrast imaging study. That's one run through the CT unit they get a bolus of contrast. Then 90 seconds later, they get their nephrogenic images. So that's a second run through the CT scanner. And then 10 minutes later, they get their excretory picture. That's the third run through the CAT scanner. Okay, so that's three CT scans that they're obtaining. The split dose, which we're using increasingly, is a little bit different in that it saves one run through the CT. What I mean by that is the patient gets a non-contrast CT scan, then they get a bolus of contrast, but there's no imaging study then. Nine minutes later, they get a second bolus of contrast, and then they have a run through the CAT scanner about 90 seconds after that second bolus. So what's happened is the first bolus of contrast given nine minutes ago is now in the collecting system, so that's your excretory phase. The bolus that was just given 90 seconds before the CT is your nephrogenic phase, and you've combined your nephrogenic and your excretory into one CT scan, thereby cutting down on radiation exposure. We all know this. What are the contraindications? Certainly at our medical center, it's the first trimester of pregnancy, and then I would call impaired baseline renal function as more of a, uh, uh, more of a relative versus absolute, depending upon GFR thresholds. Uh, for GFRs between 40 and 50 mils per minute per 1.73 meters squared, we use a hydration protocol. When it gets below 35 at our medical center, uh, our, the preference is to use a different imaging modality, namely MRI, which I'll talk about in a moment. Remember also patients can complain of um, uh, a contrast allergy or could have contrast eye allergy. Often we can overcome this by just simply premedicating with steroids or some type of antihistamine, but it certainly depends on the type of reaction they have. And we have to be cognizant that there is some inherent radiation exposure, and that's not a contraindication, but it's more for something for us to be aware of. What if you can't get a CT scan, either due to patient preference, 
uh, either due to renal function, for example. Then MR urography is a recommended imaging study for patients with contraindications to multiphasic CT. What are the advantages? Excellent visu visualization of the parenchyma and the excretory system, good visualization of the upper tracts. It obviously obviates the radiation exposure of CT, and it uses a non-ionic contrast medium, namely gadolinium, and historically, the GFR thresholds for this were listed as over 30 mils per minute per 1.73 meters squared, but I'll talk in a moment about how some of the concerns with this have increasingly changed and essentially dissipated based upon the use of some newer gadolinium agents. What are the disadvantages? Well, look, it's certainly a longer study than CT urography. You're looking at studies that are close to an hour in duration. Certainly some of our patients have claustrophobia sitting in that chamber for a period of an hour. And it is more costly, and it depends a little bit upon what the patient's pair mix is, um, as well as what part of the country you live in. But can it be anywhere from about three to $600 more expensive than CT urography? What are the contraindications? Certainly pacemakers mobile metal fragments. And I listed here this whole concept of this nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, which is really a cutaneous disorder thought to be attributable to reaction to gadolinium. It occurs in a dose independent manner. So it doesn't matter how much of the gadolinium you give, but what's really been shown increasingly and certainly has been published on by the AACR, which is the, the radiology governing body, is that the newer generations of gadolinium really don't put patients at risk for NSF. And as a consequence, our medical center will use uh, gadolinium in patients uh, even who are on hemodialysis uh, or have very low GFR thresholds without concern. So we have actually largely defaulted to using MR urography in almost all of these cases who have lower GFRs. Now, look, you're going to have some patients who can't get MR urography. They can't get CT urography. So the key thing is for the high risk patient, get some type of parenchymal imaging, non-contrast CT, non-contrast MRI or renal ultrasound. But you have to supplement that with some sort of excretory system imaging, namely retrograde pilography. And what I'd like to finish in the last five minutes, and then I'm happy to take questions is, what do you do with the patient with a negative evaluation? All right, so they go through this, they're either a low and intermediate or high risk, but this is really focusing more on the intermediate and high risk patient who's actually undergone an evaluation under your care. So let's say someone has a negative evaluation, um, you may repeat the UA within 12 months. And I think, um, as with many guideline statements, the wording is always tricky, but this is written as a may because it's not meant to be overly prescriptive, but at the same time, it's certainly a suggestion that perhaps they should get another urinalysis just given the intermittent nature of hematuria. But certainly, I think if they have a repeat UA that's negative, um, these patients can have their evaluation discontinued certainly through the urology practices, and frankly, perhaps even through their primary care practices, with the understanding that if they hit some of the situations, which I'm gonna to touch on, then they will need a repeat evaluation. And I think we tried to build these in a little bit more firmly because the prior guidelines didn't really give an endpoint of evaluation. And so there were some practices that patients describe or that providers describe where patients were coming year after year for urinalyses, despite having negative evaluations. Now, let's say the patient comes in 12 months. They had a urinalysis that showed hypoturia initially. You did an evaluation on them. It was negative. 12 months later, they walk into your office and they again have uh, evidence of microscopic hematuria. Then it goes back to this shared decision-making concept. How worried is the patient? How worried are you? What is their risk tolerance? And there are several options. And, and really the options are repeated UA in the future, or proceed with evaluation, or frankly, discontinue it based upon what other comorbidities or other, other facets that the patient is in life. Who really needs a repeat evaluation? And we wanted to sort of hammer home this point. Look, if a patient had a negative evaluation, but now they're coming into your office, and now they're complaining of pain, flank pain, pelvic pain, they're complaining of lower urinary tract symptoms, they come in and the degree of urinalysis is now increasingly positive. You evaluated at three to 10, and now they come into your office at a year and they have more than 50 red blood cells per high power feel. Or if a patient tells you, you know, now I have gross hematuria. In the last three months, I've had several episodes or even one episode where I see blood. 
then these patients need a further evaluation and they need the further evaluation that's tailored in whatever risk group they would be. So for example, the, the gross hematuria patient would be a high risk patient at this point. For somebody who had maybe 11 to 25 red blood cells per high power field, they would maybe be an intermediate risk patient. So these patients, however, do really require further evaluation. Um, I hope I was able to summarize to a greater degree some of the changes in the hematuria guidelines. Um, I think as with everything, the guidelines are always, you know, they're meant to be uh, guidelines for you to practice, but certainly not uh, patients and providers like all of us are not beholden to them. So I, I always see them as a rough, rule, a rough set of rules that hopefully uh, provide guidance to standardized care. Uh, I really want to thank you all for the opportunity to speak. I hope it was instructional and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dr. Ram. I'm just waiting for some uh, questions to come in the chat. You might have answered all the questions already. <laughs> well, I would certainly say if there are any questions that come up, um, my email, I think I sent my slides over, my emails on the front slide, uh, sure. please email me. The one question that I've been asked a lot is, um, and then I'll take the, uh, I saw a comment that came up, so I'll take that. The one question that came up is when are these actually going to be on the AUA website? When are they going to be up and running? And and usually this, this would have been presented at the AUA meeting a few weeks ago. Uh, it's end of June when they do the AUA, sorry, end of July when they do the AUA live event. Uh, these are going to be both presented and put on the website. Um, I think I saw a question. Yeah, one question came in, Dr. Meehan was asking, about a, a yearly urinalysis, uh, the primary care physician, or I guess with for patients with a history of microscopic hematuria, is that still recommended to be done? So if a patient has a urinalysis, you're, you're saying after, so I guess I would say, if, if you've evaluated a patient with who had a positive urinalysis who has microscopic hematuria, and you have said, okay, they are either they have resolution, then I would discharge them. And frankly, I don't think at that point that they should continue to have repeat evaluations by their PCP. If they have persistent microscopic hematuria, then I think that your 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 your, your you know your choice is as follows: uh, either one, you reevaluate them and you work them up, or if your index of suspicion is low, I think. You know, the guidelines are, are, are suggesting you could probably release them from your practice and have them re-engage. I mean, I think the reality is we're all really busy surgeons. And if we had patients who are perpetually coming in for repeat urinalyses, we would inundate our clinic. So I think at some point um, you got to draw the line. Okay, uh, Dr. Siemens is asking if you can show the risk stratification slide one more time. And while you find that, another question is, um, Dr. Fisher is saying, do you work up subjective hematuria if convincing story? I guess if the patient told you there's hematuria, it might be gross hematuria, perhaps. Right, so, um, yeah, so here are the risk groups uh, right over here. Okay, so correct. Um, so the trickiest one that we always have is what do you do with the patient who comes into your office? Maybe they said, hey, three weeks ago, I had a single episode of blood uh, on the toilet paper, or I had one episode where my urine looked cranberry, and I think it was blood, but I'm not sure. And then you get a urinalysis in your office, and the urinalysis doesn't show any evidence of any red blood cells. So these are tricky, and, and uh, this is where the guidelines are not perfect, but it would fall into this group. The patient is reporting to you at least as a history of what you believe is gross hematuria, and therefore they would fall into the high risk group, and therefore you would evaluate them as a high risk patient. Truthfully, I totally understand if, you know, I don't know what percentage of those patients who have, you know, a single episode truly have disease, but they do fall into the high risk group that warrants evaluation. Okay. 
Another question is talking about um, missing the diagnosis of bladder cancer or even delaying it. Um, should we move to a risk stratifying approach for microscopic hematuria evaluation? Was that talked about and maybe in the guidelines discussion? Um, a risk stratified approach for uh, for patients with microhematuria? Yeah, that's what the question was asking. Maybe um, in terms of like what tests to order or how extensive of a workup you do. Correct. So, so I, I think what I would say is um, yes. I mean, what I have. So, what I have on this slide right over here would be what the new proposal is for risk stratification. So, patients that come in who have microhematuria, you should classify them right off the bat as low, intermediate, or high and then tailor your evaluation based upon which risk group they're in. So low has essentially the lowest amount of, in, of, of investigation. Intermediate is typically cystoscopy with renal ultrasound and high is cystoscopy with CT urography. We had a question if you have any uh, expert opinion about hematospermia. Yeah, that's that's another tricky one. You know, it's interesting. I think more about sometimes hematospermia. I check a PSA and I do a DRE. I feel like you know, I, I get more, more worried truthfully with hematospermia about prostate pathology than I do admittedly about um, urinary tract carcinomas. Um, so that's a tricky one because uh, a patient who has hematospermia um, very well may have a very different pathology than what a hematuria evaluation would find. And, and one would argue that a patient with hematospermia um, would benefit a lot more from some sort of truss or transrectal approach where you're imaging the prostate preferentially, uh, as opposed to, for example, a CT urogram where you're not going to get very good delineation of some of the, the prostate anatomy. So I guess in my mind, I look at hematospermia and I think more about prostate pathology than I do grouping it in the in the hematuria realm, uh, if that makes sense. I think that does make sense to me, at least. Uh, another question with Dr. Akinola is saying the pretest probability of a positive ultrasound in the low or intermediate risk patients is really low given the subjectivity of the test. Does it really add value to the evaluation of those patients? Yep, so, so, um, it's a very good question. So, so I think um, th there's two answers to that, and and I would take you back here if you look at this slide back here, um, that the the whole concept of risk stratification is uh, here's your pretest probability just using one risk stratification model for cancer. Okay, so low risk, and it's it's slightly different with the AUA model, but but I, I don't I would hazard a guess the risks are not that different. And you're right. Look, the risk of cancer in a low risk patient is 0.2, moderate's about one and a half to two percent, high risk is 10 percent. So, if your question is, well, geez, in this low intermediate risk group, which is here, what is really the value of ultrasound? I can totally hear what you're saying. We're we're going to be imaging a lot of people with renal ultrasonography, very few of whom may have urinary tract cancers, and that's why the low is now the low risk group no longer mandates that these patients need either imaging or cystoscopy. The challenge with moderate and high risk, particularly moderate or intermediate as the AUA calls it, is the following. It goes back to the medical legal implications, right? So even if the risk of cancer is 2%, somebody is that 2%. And so when you get to these patients who have a higher pretest probability, Although the potential likelihood of finding pathology is low, I do think that to avoid sort of the medical legal implications, renal ultrasound was a happy medium for evaluating the upper tracts. And if the renal ultrasound was abnormal, then, then the guidelines talk about defaulting to axial imaging to further evaluate. How about uh, assessing the pediatric population? And although they're low risk, would an ultrasound be reasonable and exclude cystoscopy? Yeah, so it's a really good question. And, I, and I'm sure Dr. Kogan could probably speak a lot more to this than, than I can. So I would tell you right off the bat that these guidelines, 
were written specifically for the adult, quote unquote, the adult patient population. So we censored articles for review at 18 or greater. So um, I think we all understand that the pathologies you see in the pediatric population are vastly different than what you would see in the adult population. And I think that ultrasound is used far more ubiquitously in evaluating pediatric patients than, than frankly, CT or MR imaging. So truth be told, um, there, there's no prescriptive uh, guideline with regards to the pediatric patients. Um, I think Dr. Kogan's on. I'm happy to hear his thoughts on, on um, hematuria in the pediatric patient population. He also, uh, Dr. Kogan put in the chat that it may not be cancer, but it could be important to find something like nephrolithopsis, especially in the kids. So they may have early uh, treatment or um, medical treatment, something like that. Say, I, I was referring in my chat to adults. So I guess my question for adults is, is there value, you, you hone this down for not missing cancers, which I get, but is there value in finding stones or other pathology uh, in these cases? So you might not do an ultrasound because you're low risk of cancer, but there's some explanation and patients may be reassured to say, oh, you have a small kidney stone that's probably causing your hematuria or your BPH is causing your hematuria and we don't have to worry about it. So that was the adult question as, as far as kids, my comment would be, you don't get urothelial cancers, uh, so we don't worry about those at all. And the rare cases where they get rhabdomyosarcoma, which is the cancer that we see in kids or Wilms tumor, um, they don't usually present with hematuria. So uh, we really don't have to work up hematuria in kids unless if they have proteinuria, if they have um, uh, peripheral edema, then obviously we look for nephrologic causes. And in gross hematuria, we might do an ultrasound, but for the most part, we would almost never do a cystoscopy for uh, the purpose of finding hematuria in, ch in children. My, my other comment was, is there value in finding non-malignant causes in hematuria in adults? So, so yeah, it's a great question. So um, this, this was a big topic of discussion, which is the question of um, what are we trying to find and and that in turn would dictate how much you image or you don't image to find these pathologies. And so the thought was, right or wrong, that um, theoretically two things. Number one, patients who have, for example, stone disease would be perhaps symptomatic. Patients who have a stricture may or may not be symptomatic, but they would have had some sort of antecedent history that would prompt you to do an evaluation. So I guess the thought was, Although it's the microhematuria guidelines, this is really looking more at the asymptomatic population with the thought process being that if somebody had symptoms, then of course symptom directed evaluation would be um, would be recommended. I think the other part of it is to your point, look, if you have a patient who comes in, even if they're low risk and they say, Doc, I want to know what you, what do you mean? I have three to ten red blood cells per high power field, and you're telling me the risk of cancer is one percent. What if I'm that one percent? Look, the guidelines do say, hey, your options are you can get a renal ultrasound and do a cystoscopy if the patient uh, and you have some concerns that there is somehow in this broad guideline sense pathology that needs to be identified, and that being, frankly, you know, the vast majority of what we're going to probably find is not cancer, but as you alluded to, stone disease, BPH, uh, some sort of benign pathology. Awesome. Dr. Meehan was asking a little bit about uh, painless gross hematuria and a trouble with sometimes primary care or initial providers not subsequently providing a urologic consultation. Do you have any uh, tactics to mitigate that issue? Um, is it further education or what can we do to help prevent that from happening? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, it, it, it's a great question. So we see this, uh, the exact point that Dr. Mian brought up is unfortunately ubiquitous. I, I showed some of the data. Uh, we have looked at our health system and only 43% of patients with hematuria and, and in that cohort, um, only 43% are referred to urology. And even when we've looked at gross hematuria, only two thirds. So we, we miss a third of patients. 
And and so there's a variety of different ways that um, the hope is to tackle this. One is education, uh, first and foremost. And and uh, I think we all see, you know, we get referrals for for things that are not hematuria, like a positive dipstick. And at the same time, we have gross macroscopic hematuria that's attributed to being on blood thinners. Although we all know there must be an underlying cause that needs to be evaluated. So I think one is education. Two is, frankly, our hope is by creating guidelines that are a little bit more risk stratified that we actually capture these high risk people, right? So, you know, we don't want to inundate the workload on low risk patients, but we certainly don't want to miss the high risk patients. And then, truthfully, one of the things that I've seen, uh, I've done a lot of work with uh, one of these biomarker companies. And for example, if you go outside the United States, it's very interesting. In New Zealand, for example, um, the the actual the government has they have these hematuria clinics, and part of the hematuria evaluation um, in the primary care setting is everyone gets with macroscopic hematuria gets a urinary biomarker, and those that are positive on the biomarker sense are referred, obviously preferentially, because now the primary care provider has additional information to suggest the potential for cancer. So different healthcare model, different, you know, it's it's a capitated system there versus you know more of a fee for service here. So it's different healthcare models, but I think some of it's education. I think a lot of it's education, frankly. Some of it, the onus is on us to have better guidelines, which I think we've done. And the third is is you know thinking about how can we better permeate our primary care colleagues so we get the referrals that need to be evaluated. But but it's everything that that Dr. Mian said is is unfortunately totally correct. I have a question for you. What can the residents and medical students expect and be excited about um, from the educational aspect of the AUA? What do you got in store for us? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's really interesting. I, I, I think that I, I had a meeting this morning and I'm, I'm spending the next year um, taking in a lot of this, and then I, I start my term officially in, in about 12 months. And here's the new reality that I think we've become familiar with is um, lectures like what I just gave you here um, used to be a mainstay of, of meetings, right? It was very didactic oriented and very much um, uh, speaker audience full of people. And I think what this has taught all of us, frankly, is uh, you can accomplish this very effectively um, whether it's through this lecture series, you know, the UCSF has a lecture series, New York City has a lecture series, um, the AUA has a lecture series. So you can accomplish didactic education. So I think what's the future? I, there's a lot of work being done now to actually make a lot of the content at the AUA, number one, video based, number two, far more interactive. So, you know, one would argue the talk I just gave you now you know, how would this be presented perhaps differently at the AUA meeting? Case-based, right? Case-based where people are, as opposed to me just running through this, going through the whole structure case-based. And then I think video. So, you know, how does how do learners learn now? Uh, through video, video interface. And so um, I think what you're going to see um, is a lot more of a push towards um, video-based education, uh, tailoring to, you know, everyone's got an iPhone, right? So a lot of stuff is going to be app related um, coming up, I think, in the next 12 months. The SASP questions that I'm sure you guys all do, our residents do them. Uh, they're actually going to go not only onto your phone as an app, but they're going to be, for example, sortable for content. So let's say you 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 felt like you were weak in adrenal pathology. Instead of going through a whole year of SASP, you could actually sort on your phone, hey, why don't you hit me with all the SASP adrenal questions over 15 years? So I think a lot of it is tailoring to the way we learn now, which is not sitting and reading and listening to long lectures, but making it more interactive and in short bursts. I really look forward to that. I think that's gonna, you guys are all on the right track on what helps the millennials learn. But if you have any ideas, email me because uh, I'm I'm more than willing to take uh, good suggestions and pawn them off as my own ideas. I'll email you or uh, direct message you on Twitter. Yep, <laughs> that's so great. I have some good ideas. We've been doing a lot of stuff here in Albany, so um, anything I think would be useful, I could uh, help suggest. I w yeah, I would love to do that. Okay, excellent.
right. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate it. I think we learned a lot of uh, the newest updates and uh, and thank you so much. Thanks, Jay. Great talk. Appreciate it. Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate it. You guys have a great day. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye.